I don't know about you, but when I was 19, I certainly was not creating multi-million dollar franchises at my day job. He didn't know it yet, but that's exactly what young Japanese programmer Masahiro Sakurai was doing in 1989. Shortly after the Game Boy's launch, Nintendo opened up to developers asking for submissions for a game that anyone could enjoy, and so 19-year-old Sakurai at HAL Laboratory got to work. The team at HAL began creating a new platform for the Game Boy using a little blob as a placeholder for a character. They knew that they needed to have a really cute character for the game to be truly approachable, and eventually the placeholder blob became the greatest blob of all time, Kirby. When asked about Kirby's design in a 1993 developer interview, founding member of HAL Studios, Satoru Iwata, said, when someone really loves a character, they like to sketch him in their notebooks, right? That's why we gave Kirby a simple, circular design, so that anyone could draw him. Great insight, Iwata, but somehow half the entire team at HAL Laboratories can't do that. Anyways, Popopo, or Twinkle Popo, who would later be named Kirby, couldn't have come at a better time for HAL Laboratories. They had been slowly sinking into bankruptcy due to a cycle of rushed, poorly developed games, and the 1992 Game Boy game Hoshi no Kirby, or Kirby's Dreamland, helped point them back in the right direction. Buckle up guys, because we've got over 20 more Kirby games to get to in this video. The next Kirby installment came in 1993 for the Famicom, and it came with some really big changes, partially inspired by the newly appointed president of HAL, Satoru Iwata. Rather than just sucking up his enemies, the team at HAL Laboratories wanted to make things a little more interesting, so they gave him his signature copy ability. There were originally over 40 abilities in development, some of which made their debut in a Kirby game over a decade later, like Kirby's animal ability in Squeak Squad. With Nintendo in charge of marketing, this game was a big success. In the same year, HAL Laboratories also produced Kirby Pinball Land for the Game Boy. It's worth noting that within the first three years of Kirby's life, there were more spin-offs than there were main series games. 1995 brought us Kirby Avalanche, which is quite literally just a Kirby-skinned Puyo Puyo, Kirby's Block Ball, which is a breakout clone, and Kirby Bowl or Kirby Dream Course, which is an isometric view golf-themed game that was originally not planned to include Kirby at all. 1995 also brought us the Game Boy sequel Kirby's Dream Land 2. This game introduced some of Kirby's friends, which would continue to appear in Kirby games occasionally. Greg the Hamster, Koo the Owl, and Kind the Sunfish, as well as Gooey, who I'm still pretty sure is just one of Hirokai Suga's shitty drawings come horrifically to life. A remake of this game was in the works for the Game Boy Color, but was later canned. Around this time, a mysterious Kirby game for the Super Nintendo was being developed. No, I'm not talking about Kirby's Dream Land 3 or Kirby Superstar. This was Kid Kirby, and it was actually being worked on by DMA Design, a Scottish company you might know as Rockstar. Not much is known about this game, or even how DMA Design got the green light to work on a Kirby game. All we know about Kid Kirby is from promotional artwork in a Mexican Club Nintendo magazine, that it was meant to utilize the Super Nintendo mouse, and from an ex-DMA employee releasing some of these pictures to the public. Okay, let's talk about a real Kirby game. 1996's Kirby Superstar slash Kirby Fun Pack slash Hoshino Kirby Super Deluxe. <sighs> in this game, which is really like eight games in one, the copy ability hats were introduced, changing Kirby's appearance based off the ability he currently has. It also introduced cooperative multiplayer, allowing a friend to play alongside Kirby as a helper. Following that, we had Kirby Star Stacker, another Game Boy puzzle game and its Japan exclusive sequel on the Super Famicom, Kirby no Kira Kira Kizu. There were also some satellite broadcast Kirby minigames for the Satellaview around this time, but for those of us outside of Japan, kind of irrelevant. Kirby's Dream Land 3 is a super gorgeous game, and introduced even more cute animal friends for Kirby. Slime fans rejoice, because you can go through this game as gooey if you're player 2. Unfortunately, this game was released well after the distribution of the N64, and was actually the last Nintendo published Super Nintendo game released in the United States, making it difficult to find and relatively expensive. The Nintendo 64 had probably my favorite Kirby game of all time, but before this game was in the works, there was actually yet another cancelled 3D Kirby game. At the 1995 Shoshinkai Trade Show, a demo of Kirby Bowl 64 was shown off alongside Pilot Wings 64 and Super Mario 64, and it was expected to be a launch title like those were. It pretty much vanished without explanation, and we didn't see a 3D Kirby game until the year 2000. That game, Kirby and the Crystal Shards, had an interesting development history. The team at HAL had a working prototype for a classic Kirby 64 game as early as October 1997. In an interview with project manager Takashi Saito, he stated that the original version was pretty much a clone of Kirby Adventure in a simulated 3D environment. According to him, the game worked well and was fun, but they ultimately decided that they could quote, do better. The final release of Kirby and the Crystal Shards had a really awesome new mechanic that was never really used much again the ability to combine powers to create some incredibly unique and fun abilities. 
Whether you prefer to see Kirby shoot missiles out of his face, wield Darth Maul's lightsaber, or literally become a fridge, there's definitely an ability for everybody. Additionally, his Cutter Plus Stone ability will carve him into one of his allies from Dreamland 3, which is a pre pretty cute little nod to Kirby history. Kirby Tilt and Tumble is a pretty unique game, I'll give it that. It came in a translucent pink shell and featured an accelerometer inside the cartridge. Tilting your Game Boy in different directions would roll him across the course, and that's about the gist of the game. GameCube's sequel to Tilt and Tumble was planned far into development, with Shigeru Miyamoto even showing footage and giving a 2002 Japanese release date. This game would have utilized the GameCube's connectivity with the Game Boy Advance, but once again, the game was quietly canned. Now, before I start on the GameCube era, I want to mention that there was an 11 year gap between main series console-based Kirby games. During this time, HAL built and scrapped three different Kirby projects, and one was even shown off at E3 2005. I've mentioned before HAL and Iwata's ridiculous obsession with perfection, and this is probably the biggest proof of it that I can offer. To Iwata, these games never fully came together perfectly, and rather than risk a mediocre Kirby release, HAL Laboratories scrapped a decade's worth of work. Well, Kirby Air Ride came out at least, although I can't say I wouldn't have preferred a main series Kirby game. It's a racing game, and it's far too easy, but it was the first game to feature LAN play using the GameCube's broadband adapters. Oh yeah, I want to primarily focus on Kirby games, but it wouldn't be a true Kirby history if I didn't mention that there was a manga and the anime adaption Kirby Right Back at you, which ran for a hundred episodes. Masahiro Sakurai was heavily involved and made a number of major decisions about the anime's parameters, including that Kirby could talk and that there were to be no humans. It's a pretty useful marketing tool for the games, of course, which brings us to... Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland, a fully updated remake of Kirby's Adventure, which of course was heavily promoted during commercial breaks in the anime. After that, we saw another Game Boy Advance game, Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, which was actually a joint effort between HAL and two other game studios. Its maze-like levels resemble more like a friendly Castlevania-type game rather than a traditional platformer. Interestingly enough, this game has no mention or appearance of our favorite penguin, King Dedede. When the Nintendo DS hit the market, many game studios wanted to use the touchscreen as a core gameplay mechanic. Kirby Canvas Curse is a testament to that, so instead of running and jumping with the D-pad, you control Kirby's movements by painting a path for him to roll on. Honestly, so many of these touchscreen games were boring, but Canvas Curse still holds up as a pretty fun little adventure. There would be three more Kirby DS games to hit the market. Kirby Squeak Squad, Kirby Superstar Ultra, and Kirby Mass Attack. Squeak Squad was, in my opinion, relatively forgettable. Sorry to all you Squeak Squad fans out there, but did include a few of the combined copy abilities of Kirby 64. Kirby Superstar Ultra remade the beloved Super Nintendo game Kirby Superstar, adding quite a few additional games. And Kirby Mass Attack went back to the touchscreen heavy controls in a puzzle platforming adventure, and also takes place in the Pogpo Islands, a reference to Kirby's original name. Kirby's Epic Yarn for the Wii received tons of praise after its debut showing at E3 2010. It's a pretty unique Kirby game that has new abilities based off manipulated yarn shapes rather than sucking up enemies. Believe it or not, the first time we saw a yarn Kirby was all the way back in the early 90s in a Japanese commercial for Kirby Adventure on the Famicom. As far as I know, there's no actual correlation between the two, as Epic Yarn wasn't originally planned to be a Kirby game anyways. The Wii also brought us a really great classic Kirby adventure, Kirby Return to Dreamland. This is the final product of the 11 years of development hell that saw three Kirby games get created and scrapped, most closely resembling the four-player co-op gameplay shown in 2005. By now, we're all the way to 2012, which marks the 20th anniversary of the very first Kirby game. Kirby Dream Collection is a celebration of the pink puffball throughout the years and features six classic Kirby games, Kirby Dreamland 1 through 3, Kirby Adventure, Kirby Superstar, and Kirby and the Crystal Shards. A few bonus stages were added here and there, and of course it also included concept art, soundtrack selection, and all that, but overall not much new to see. On the 3DS we first got Kirby Triple Deluxe, which is a fairly classic Kirby game in nature. Its one major change is Kirby's Hypernova ability, which allowed him to suck up all kinds of crazy things on the screen instead of just regular enemies. The game's director, Shinya Kumazaki, said in an interview that this was an important step forward for Kirby, as he had always been depicted in marketing as being able to suck up anything, yet gameplay limitations had always kept him from actually doing so. He also remarked on the new minigame, a Super Smash Bros. style brawler called Kirby Fighters, saying that it caused the team at HAL to rethink the balance and usefulness of many of Kirby's copy abilities, omitting some like Stone from the minigame entirely. The pink dude can't avoid the touchscreen for long, so we're back to Canvas Curse mechanics with the Wii U Kirby game, Kirby and the Rainbow Curse. In a 2015 GameSpot interview, art director Terahiko Suzuki explained that although Kirby was made out of clay in this world, he wasn't supposed to take on any clay properties like he did when he was yarn in a world of yarn. It was a stylistic choice that captured the transformative nature of Kirby as a character. 
Finally, at the end of our current Kirby history is the 3DS game Kirby Planet Robobot. Although it's not the first Kirby game with Amiibo support, this game got its own small line of Kirby Amiibo to be used in the game. You know, in case your Kirby game needs to be even easier. How Laboratories was at its most transparent during this game, opening up a Miiverse group where they answered questions about development and showed off some early ideas. This one was a pretty story-intensive game, so a lot of the stuff they talk about has to do with the plot. That wraps it up for your Kirby history, so let's close out with some fun facts. Most people know that Kirby wasn't always pink, but the developers at HAL had conflicting views on its actual color. Sakurai knew that the white color of Kirby's Dreamland was simply a color limitation of the hardware, and it always pictured him as being pink. When they started designing Kirby's Adventure for the Famicom, Miyamoto was super confused this whole time thinking he had been yellow, others thought he had been white, or other colors. Kirby's original possible name list included Twinkle Popo and Gasper, but Miyamoto said in a 1993 interview that they wanted him to sound like, quote, an American Idol. In this interview, he also admits that Kirby was indeed a reference to John Kirby, Nintendo's lawyer during the Universal Studios Nintendo Donkey Kong dispute. During the development of Kirby games, there was a running joke within HAL Studios that only Sakurai's Kirby drawings were referred to as Kirby. Everyone else's drawings were referred to his old name as Twinkle Popo, probably because Sakurai is the only one who knows how to freaking draw him. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more in-depth video game history, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.